Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for joining us for the Aspen Spotlight Health, Technological Revolution in Medicine and Public Health. I am excited to introduce our presenters today who include physicians, engineers, chemists, behavioral scientists, a really diverse group, all of whom are experts in their fields and have been recognized widely for their contributions. For example, we have White House Fellows, we have members of the Order of the British Empire, we have Global Thinker Awards, Young Entrepreneur Awardees, Most Creative in Business Awardees, and trust me when I say that's just a sample. This is an impressive set of panelists presenting today. The diversity um, in the panelists and the technologies they've developed are united with a common theme of advancing the health and welfare of the world's population. I can share with you I've had an opportunity to speak with each of these panelists and trust me when I say you guys are in for a treat. The topics today will span the continuum of healthcare from disease prevention to treatment and recovery. You're gonna hear about technologies and how they're improving the life of people worldwide, from addressing public health issues in developing nations to leveraging technology to deliver products that improve wellness, recovery, and quality of life. You'll also hear about ideas and innovations that are adaptations and expansions of existing devices. Today we have seven presenters who will each share their expertise with you in 10-minute uh, TED-style talks. Our first four will be talking about topics relative to innovation and technologies for health diagnostics and therapeutics. And the next presenters will talk about innovations and technologies for health promotion and disease prevention. As you can imagine, we have a lot to cover we only have 90 minutes here, we have seven presenters, and we do want to make sure we create an opportunity for you guys to interact with these um, inspiring presenters. And so after our last presentation, we're gonna get the entire group up here, and we will uh, reserve uh, 10 minutes or so to have some questions from you guys in the audience. So I ask for you to hold your questions to the end, which I think will be difficult. Um, without further delay, what I'd like to do is introduce our first presenter. Uh, Major John Lichtenberger is an active duty Air Force Major who treats combat veterans and provides the ability for wounded warriors to recover functionality via imaging and technology. He's currently serving as the Assistant Professor of Radiology at the Uniformed Services University of Health Sciences and is service chief for the 3D Medical Application Center at Walter Reed. He's a medical doctor and did a fellowship in thoracic and cardiac imaging at Massachusetts General Hospital. John's gonna be talking today about 3D printing in medicine and combat casualty care. John? Can you hear me? Can you hear me if I speak like this? Yeah, great. Hi, everyone. So I'm John Lichtenberger. Thank you, Julie. Thank you to the Aspen Ideas Festival for inviting me. I'm really excited to be here to share with you what we do for our combat veterans and in medicine with a new technology, a simple technology, and I'll talk about that, but uh, how we bring that together in medicine is, is my goal today. So first, if any of you thought that this was a matter of national security, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Uh, these are my opinions and not those of the DOD or the Air Force. So uh, you can leave, I won't be upset, but uh, hopefully you'll stay. So where do I live? My creative space is at the intersection of 3D printing, which some of you might have heard about, and medicine. So the old terminology for 3D printing, the original terminology was additive manufacturing. So I'll start my talk with explaining to you what that means and how we incorporate that into the second part, the second realm that I live in, which is in medicine, but more specifically in the care of our veterans as they come back from wars and sustain kind of traumas that we haven't seen people live through in prior conflicts. So we're dealing with new technology, 
a simple new technology and old problems in a new patient population, a young patient population that they're going to have a lifetime to deal with the kind of traumas that they've sustained, and how, how can we help them in that way? So this is a patent, I know none of you can read this, but this is a patent for um, 3D printing or additive manufacturing as it came out. And the only thing that's important about this little piece of paper, well, there are two things. The first thing is 1986. That's the date in the upper left-hand corner. 86 was when this was originally patented, the idea of building something with layers and layers. So you build a layer, and then you come back in and you build another layer, and you keep doing that until you get to a structure. So my four-year-old will sit down with her little pyramid and build her pyramid, and it's, it's very much the same concept, so it's nothing too sophisticated. The next thing I want to talk about is a little diagram at the end, and I only want to bring that up because I don't want you to fall in love with the technology where we are right now. Just the idea of building on something by layers is all you really need to know to unify all the different ways of doing 3D printing. This is the National Week of Making, if you didn't know. Uh, in the, it's a White House initiative talking about making. Uh, many of you might know about the kind of national movement of making where people can build things in their own homes and can kind of hack their own lives. And I, I love this idea of the maker movement. So uh, welcome to that. And that gives us some foundation. So here again is our two different diagrams of the way we do 3D printing. And the most important part again is that layer by layer. You can extrude something, as you see on your right. You can extrude something in layers and lay it down until you get a structure. Or you can build on a platform, have a platform that kind of descends into a vat. And all of that is easier to understand if we watch it happen. So the metal grate is the platform that we're talking about. That platform is really important. And it's sitting in a vat of photosensitive polymer. And what happens is you can see those little sparks of light. Those little sparks of light make the polymer uh, congeal in a way that we control. And if we do that for long enough, this is very dramatic. It kind of rises up at the end. And if we do that m many layers at a time, at the end we can get a structure, any structure that we want. Um, any structure that we can design, we can print. Now the next part of this is something that makes us very special in my lab, is that we do printing in titanium. Most development in 3D printing is by trial and error. They build something in plastic, they break it, they build it again. Look at this, it's kind of like a discotheque. It's kind of exciting. <laughs> so what we did is we put down that titanium powder, you saw that come down, and then now we're, we're solidifying that titanium, and then we'll come back over and put another layer, and we'll solidify that in a very specific pattern. And at the end, there's a little bit of post-processing to do uh, where you have to take off the rest of the residue and get everything. But in the end, you get the product that you put into that machine. You get that thing printed out. I will tell you exactly what this is. I don't want you to be mystified. I'll tell you all about that soon. But I want to take one, just 10 seconds for us all to imagine. If I gave you these two machines, these two machines you just saw, could you print something? What would you print if, I, if you could? And then once you think of that, I want you to think of what would you print to help somebody else, to help somebody in their medical care or just in their daily life? Good, so I am gonna to talk to you now about the things that we've done. So here is our young soldier. I won't tell you his name, but he was a, a, a combat veteran, and I think we can all notice this cranial defect here on the left side of his head. Now, how did that happen? So if you sustain traumatic brain injury, I'm sure you've all heard a lot about that. If you sustain a trauma significant to hurt your brain, the first thing your brain does is it starts to swell. Just like if you slam your thumb in a door, the first thing it does is start to swell. Now the difference between your thumb and your brain is that your brain lives in this bony box. And so when the brain swells within this box, it really hurts itself. So we try to prevent the brain from hurting itself by creating in theater, which means when you're in war, uh, in a forward hospital, you will open up a part of the skull, do a craniectomy, as it were, and take out that piece of skull. In the beginning of the war, what did we do? We took that piece of bone and we buried it in their abdomen uh, to keep that piece of bone alive. That was a terrible 
terrible idea. We couldn't keep track of who had the bone, where did they put the bone, how long was the bone there. It's the fog of war, I'm telling you. It's a real phenomenon, and we care. I mean, that's what we do in military medicine. We care about these people uh, to the best of our ability, and still we couldn't keep track of it. So what did, what did we bring to the table? So this is a reconstruction of that person's brain CT. So on a CT scanner, I, I don't have really time to go into explaining CT, but you've all seen it on Scrubs, right? You've seen how a CT works. Uh, you go in, it's kind of x-rays, a lot of x-rays, and you get a very beautiful anatomic detail. So this is just the skull from that CT, and you can see his defect, and then we do this. We mirror image his anatomy. So we're not taking a product off the shelf. We're not, we don't have a one-size-fits-all craniotomy cap. Uh, we mirror image his skull to the other side, and then we do something. No two skulls are alike, no two defects are alike, and no two neurosurgeons are alike, right? So the neurosurgeon wants these fasteners. You guys can kind of see the fasteners wants these fasteners in a certain orientation. That's how they want to secure that thing at the end to the skull. So we do that for them. And here it is, printed out in titanium. So that, again, is very special. There may be 50 titanium printers in the country, and ours is probably the only one in a hospital setting. Here it is being implanted on your right. And if you take everything I just told you and invert it, we have, on the left, we've actually put in, you can actually see that little rim of titanium, we've put in a surgical guide. So in another patient who needs to actually have that piece of their skull removed, how does the surgeon know where they're supposed to cut when they get into the OR? Well, this is the modern way of doing it. We, we give them a scaffold, or we give them a template to go in and, and do that resection. Here he is at the end. He's holding our skull. He's quite skeptical, if you can't tell on the right, <laughs> that this is going to work. But on the left, he's, he's pretty happy, I think, and uh, that, that, I think, served him very well. So uh, a term that we use in our, oh my goodness, is complexity is free. And what I want to tell you now is that failure is on clearance. So in 3D printing, when you use additive manufacturing, you can do you can do very complicated things in a very sophisticated way. So in this person who had a significant facial fracture, we can print out exactly where each of those pieces of bone is and how the surgeon should put that back together. Here is a, here is a tumor at the skull base that we can print and show a surgeon where that tumor is. This is a young child who was born with their heart outside of their chest. And how do we help that person? Well, we build them a cage to protect their heart until they're old enough to uh, have, have a, a final closure. So necessity may be the mother of invention, but play, play has a role, uh, whether that's the other mother or the father. That's, that's a role, and I want us to talk about that. This is from the Paralympics. Um, these women are amazing, and they have very sophisticated and um, expensive prosthesis. You can see all of them have a, have a leg prosthesis. We can't do that for our soldiers because this guy wants to get married on the beach. You can't take that prosthesis to the beach, so we built that. And you guys all saw how that was done just a minute ago. And here he is using, oh. Here he is using that for the first time. This is his first time on those prosthesis. So this protects his residual limb while allowing him to kind of do the activities he needs to do. Now, he rapidly talked to his friends about this technology, and this friend wanted to be able to get up and down out of a, uh, under a car. He still wants to be a, me a mechanic. The most compelling part of these stories is how we enable people to do the activities that they wanted to do. So they're done with their healing part, or maybe they're still progressing through their healing after their uh, trauma. But how do we help them to recover that part that makes them human? And how do we help them recover uh, of the functions that they want to do. So I'm out of time. Uh, I, <laughs> I'm very sorry. I get very excited about this stuff. Uh, I just want to show you one last thing. And this is all the small little things that we build for them and print for them to help them to, to do the things that they want to do in their daily life. So I challenge you and I encourage you to think about, if you can imagine it, we can print it. And can you think of a way to help somebody else? So thank you very much. told you you were in for a treat. Thank you very, very much. That was incredible. Our next presenter today is uh, Stephen Bopart. He's a professor of engineering and faculty member 
of the Beckman Institute for Advanced Science and Technology at the University of Illinois. He is dual trained as an engineer and a doctor. He directs the Biophotonics Imaging Laboratory and the Center for Optical Molecu Molecular Imaging. He was named by MIT's Technology Review Magazine as one of the top 100 young innovators in the world. Here to present Imaging, the True Colors of Cancer. Well, thank you very much, Julie, and, and really it's remarkable to be here, and, and I'm so happy to be uh, amongst all these great ideas and minds and, and, and allow me to share some of my ideas with you today. So cancer is, is something that impacts all of our lives. So one in three of us will have cancer in our lifetime. One in eight women will have breast cancer in their lifetime. If you're not a cancer patient or a cancer survivor, uh, you're a family member, a spouse, uh, a caregiver, and, and for all these reasons, cancer is important to all of us. I myself have had bouts with, with cancer. I'm a cancer survivor, having survived a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a cancer of the blood, and, uh, and, and underwent a bone marrow transplant. My, my wife and mother of our three children uh, was diagnosed and surgically treated for breast cancer at age 37. And it's, it's a complex problem that all of us have to continue to think about. Vice President uh, Biden has announced the Cancer Moonshot uh, Initiative or program. And I think this is critical because it raises the awareness and it, it puts the awareness that cancer is a, as complex of a problem as sending a man to the moon and bringing that, that man back safely to Earth. And so this, this awareness of this, the complexity of this problem is so important. That's what my lab at the University of Illinois does. The Biophotonics Imaging Lab addresses these complex problems with a highly interdisciplinary approach, combining engineering with medicine, biology, to, to better understand disease, to detect disease, and, and, and quantify that in, in more defined ways. Specifically, my lab develops optical imaging technologies and then uses these to detect the very origins of, of disease processes such as cancer. If we think about biomedical imaging in the most general sense, then we know that we image structures across many different scales. Maybe it's the whole body, maybe it's organs or tissues or, or cells or molecules. But we also have to think that it's equally important to understand the function of what's going on across all these scales. There may be a tumor present, but is that tumor quiescent or is it really aggressive? And that's, that speaks to the function of what might be going on inside that tumor. So both of these are very important. Now, many of you probably are familiar or had experiences yourself with imaging. And I would say imaging in the clinical setting has done phenomenal results. We saw some examples, really, of how imaging is used for 3D printing. Uh, but imaging has completely eliminated the need, for instance, to do exploratory surgery to find out what's, you know, what that bellyache might be from. We can image inside. Well, if we also know that disease starts at the genetic the molecular, the cellular level, then we have to develop and use technologies that can image at those scales too. And that's where optics and biophotonics comes into play that allows us this ability to view the, mo the molecules, the cells at that scale. Now, to give one example is breast cancer. So currently, traditionally, historically, the surgical treatment of breast cancer is to remove that mass send it to pathology, and pathologists will examine just by the eye and decide which areas that they want to take and look at microscopically under a microscope. So they'll take those areas, they'll, they'll um, stain it, they'll section it, they'll fix it. This process takes days to do. And essentially, they put on a slide and, and look at stained tissue to provide color and to look at the structure of the cells that are present there. And it may be hard to see, but what I've shown here is a negative breast margin or a positive margin. And why that's important, because if there's a positive margin, meaning if there's tumor cells at that margin where the surgeon made the cut, then it means that there's tumor cells left behind. And in fact, one out of three women that undergo breast conserving surgery like this have to be reoperated on because tumor cells are left behind. And we only discover this days later in the path lab when they look microscopically. So as an engineer, I, I just find this completely unacceptable. And so using some of our technologies, we built 
an instrument that essentially gives that microscopic view to the surgeon. This is a handheld probe that the surgeon now uses to scan across tissue. It's, it's based on optical coherence tomography, which is the optical analog to ultrasound. So instead of putting in sound waves and collecting those back, we put in light waves and collect those back. But we can actually see cells and individual cells within that tissue without having to take the tissue out and stain it. And we can do this in a matter of seconds to minutes to provide that real-time view so the surgeon can make that inter interventional decision at the time of surgery rather than having to wait several days to kind of know whether or not he or she got all the tumor out. Now, these images that I'm showing here and, and the example of the positive margin, that's a small foci of tumor cells that could not be visualized or even felt um, by the surgeon. And so this provides new senses, a new ability to see at that microscopic scale. Now, these images really are just built on structure. And as I said, structure is only one part of this problem. We have to be able to understand the function. Fortunately, optics has a lot of different tools, and we can pull from that toolkit to be able to use technologies that allow us to look at the metabolism or the, the microstructure or the function of what's going on in these cells. And so through a set of different techniques that are lumped together under nonlinear optical imaging techniques, we can see collagen, we can see membranes, we can see the lipids or proteins, the molecules that are present. We can look at metabolism, and, and importantly, we've been able to identify microvesicles. These show up as little small packages that the tumor cells produce and get distributed throughout the whole body. And so in a sense, they're preconditioning the rest of the tissue, the organ, the breast, the body, to prepare for those metastasizing tumor cells. These technologies are allowing us to better understand the process of carcinogenesis. And by doing that, perhaps to design and develop new therapies. Now, if we combine these all together, we can get incredibly, I would say, beautiful, artful images of, of tissue, of tumors, of cancer. And in fact, this is of a completely fresh piece of tissue without stains. This was generated in just minutes. And it's revealing what I like to think of as the true colors of cancer, where with this technology, we can now look in many different ways. Each of these colors and inf contain information. This is our big data problem. We have terabytes of information to go through to understand the relationships. These are those small microvesicles and being able to watch where those go and how they change that tissue. Now this raises a really interesting and provocative question. Our current standard of care is for the pathologist to look at cells and understand that structural tumor margin. Where is that margin between tumor and normal tissue? Well, what we're seeing is that there are molecular changes that are taking place throughout the entire organ, throughout the entire body. So do we have to rethink and redefine, is there a molecular margin between normal and abnormal tissue? But that is yet to come, and I think we are learning a lot more about the technology of this very complex disease as well. Now, this may be difficult to see, but, but this is just one example of a technology that's identified a healthcare need. And we translate technologies basically from the, the bench top to the patient or the bedside. And this is a bit of a cliche, but what I contend is that we're only halfway there. What we really need to do next is to take this technology from the patient to the population, to integrate new technologies into our standard of care and deliver better, more advanced medicine and healthcare with these technologies. And we do this through industry, through philanthropy, through government, but this is equally important and also perhaps even more challenging than just developing those technologies from the bench to the bedside. In addition, we have to also think about changing the way that we think and educate the next generation of physicians. And so at Illinois, in conjunction with Carl Foundation Hospital, we've established the first of its kind engineering-based college of medicine. Whereas in addition to, to simply uh, the compassionate care and the biological basis of understanding disease, we are now going to be training engineers that can also bring in engineering principles, innovation, entrepreneurial ideas, and training those compass compassionate physicians, but also the physician engineers, the physician innovators that are going to be necessary in the next generation and the future of healthcare and medicine in our country and globally. So what's important is that as we do this, we recognize that healthcare is changing and the healthcare of tomorrow is going to look nothing like what we have today. We can't uh, continue on the trends we're on 
currently, they're simply unsustainable. We have to reduce costs. We have to make healthcare more widely accessible, even globally. We have to be able to predict disease, prevent disease, detect disease early. When it is detected, we have to be able to ultimately to treat gently and cure completely. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Our next presenter, Daniel Fletcher, is the professor of bioengineering and biophysics at the University of California, Berkeley, and chair of its Department of Bioengineering, where his lab develops diagnostic medical devices and investigates biophysical mechanisms of disease. He was named one of Foreign Policy's 100 Leading Global Thinkers in 2015, and he is the founder of the medical device company called CellScope. Here to present to you disease diagnosis with mobile phones, Dan Fletcher. Thanks very much. Okay, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm not sure if everyone realizes, but there are more mobile phones in the world than there are people. And I, I see some of those in use right now. Uh, and in lectures at uh, universities, usually most of the students will be on their mobile phones. I assume taking notes and looking up background material, but possibly other things. So mobile phones, it's not surprising, have made their way into health. Many of us use our mobile phones in some way to monitor uh, how we are, uh, how many steps we are taking each day, or um, uh, to uh, get reminders for when to take medications, um, or to look up things uh, like was that quinoa salad that I had at lunch was that healthy or um, is it dangerous? Uh, and so these sorts of uses of phones um, provide us with more information and with more power over our own healthcare. Um, but what if these mobile phones could do more than that? What if they could take over some of the tests that are normally only done in clinics? What if we could monitor at a, at a more precise level um, the state of our own health? Uh, now, mobile phones have changed a bit. Um, I don't see any of the, the, the large ones with a large antenna anymore, but it wasn't long ago when, when that was the case. Um, and it is really consumer demand that has pushed mobile phones to be as capable as they are now, to be able to have tremendous processing power, great connectivity, um, and a host of other features. Mine has the ability to measure my, my oxygenation level of my blood. Uh, those sorts of things are, are, are features that people want more and more. One of the features that is particularly exciting for the work that I do um, is uh, the camera. Cameras have gotten better and better and better. And in most research labs, we rely on microscopy to study cells and behaviors and, and quantify different properties. Um, and getting a good camera is a significant expenditure. Uh, normally, we would spend $50,000 on a nice camera. Uh, and cameras in phones have gotten tremendously uh, capable, and they've gotten very, very cheap. And so Apple, I don't know if many of you have seen these billboards, but Apple has put up large billboards showcasing how good the camera is by, uh, by, by uh, showing some of the photos that can be taken with it. And so we've started to make use of those cameras for medical applications. Um, now this, this phone is, a, is really an ancient relic. Um, there was a company called Nokia that used to make phones. Uh, and Back when Nokia came out with this uh, amazing 1.3 megapixel camera, um, we, we, we jumped on it. Uh, this was actually a project that came out of an undergraduate optics class that I teach, where the goal was to figure out um, if you had a phone and you were traveling somewhere and there was a disease outbreak, what sort of optics, which you hopefully are carrying with you, uh, what would you assemble onto that phone in order to be able to take a picture of a blood sample? Rather than taking a picture of something big and making it small onto the camera, what if you wanted to take a picture of something really, really small and make it big onto the camera? And so what we did as part of the class was went through the design process of figuring out what lenses would I add and how would I configure them. And this is what uh, we ended up with. Uh, now, over, over time, we've developed that technology into something that's quite a bit more compact and more capable. Um, and the kinds of images that you can now get with phones that you don't modify at all, you simply add lenses to, um, are able to give you images of blood smears, 
Um, you can even get fluorescence images, which allow you to, to make specific measurements of parasites such as malaria and tuberculosis. Now, I want to focus on one particular disease as an example of where mobile phones may be able to have a real impact right now. And that disease is river blindness. Uh, this is a, a statue outside the World Health Organization uh, that commemorates the challenge of eradicating um, or eliminating uh, river blindness. Now, river blindness is caused by uh, worms, by a parasite that lives in the body. Uh, the parasite is smart enough not to kill, um, but it causes severe disability uh, that can involve blindness. And so this statue is showing a, a young a person leading an old person who, who is blind. Now, um, river blindness is not a problem that most of us face um, living in the US, uh, but this is a problem in other parts of the world, primarily in Africa, Central and West Africa. And uh, this is a problem that has a solution. Uh, thanks to the donation of the drug that can kill the worms that cause this disease, um, ivermectin, um, Merck uh, started a program, a mectazan donation program, that has been an incredibly successful public health program, providing as much drug as needed to help to eliminate this disease from the continent. And that has been going very well, but there's been a problem. In the late 1990s, it turns out that if you are co-infected with another worm called Loa Loa, then you are at risk of a severe adverse event, i.e. you could die, if you're given ivermectin and you're not, uh, uh, you don't know how many worms you have. So the ability to, to provide ivermectin and get rid of this disease in, in Central and West Africa has been halted in some places because it's not known who has these other worms. And so um, together with, with colleagues at the NIH and in Cameroon, um, we developed a simple mobile phone-based device to give you that answer. And the idea is taking a peripheral uh, uh, pin prick, um, wicking in blood into a simple capillary, and loading it into a mobile phone-based device. So this is uh, based on a phone that uses a small compact lens to be able to magnify the image of the blood. Uh, there's some electronics underneath it, some hobbyist uh, motors, um, a Bluetooth chip, an Arduino board that lets the, the, the phone control the position of the sample, control the focus, and capture videos where we're able to detect the motion of this Loa Loa worm. And so what that looks like is, is here. So that's a movie is playing um, the detected motion of the worm from videos taken by the phone. And it turns out you can do this analysis, thanks to the computational power of phones, right there on the phone. So in a matter of two or three minutes, it's possible to figure out if someone has a high load of these worms or not, and as a result, be able to give ivermectin uh, directly. And so with uh, these collaborators in Cameroon, uh, we were able to, um, last fall, um, use these devices and restart mass drug administration in this particular district um, and uh, treat people uh, for the first time uh, in, in a number of years because uh, we could now detect those who were at risk of adverse events and eliminate them from the treatment program, put them into a different treatment program for those with high levels of Loa Loa. The way this works, um, uh, a simple pin prick, load it into the, uh, into the device, press a button, and the answer is presented, either a big red bar like that, which means don't give ivermectin, or a green one, which means it's okay, or at least that reflects the counts, the doctor needs to make the decision. Uh, and uh, based on that, um, uh, we were able to, to, to go through about 16,000 patients uh, this past fall, and we'll be doing that again uh, this coming fall. Um, now, this uh, provides just one example of where a mobile phone, the imaging capability, the processing capability, all on the phone without the need for any connectivity, um, are, is able to uh, uh, contribute to uh, l elimination of, of, a, of a disease. Now, there are many other applications where mobile phones and simple imaging can play a useful role. Uh, we've started to send devices to collaborators in a range of different um, application areas, both infectious diseases, but it turns out also in research. The other part of my lab does very basic research, and we now use mobile phone-based microscopes for quick assays on the benchtop. Um, these are becoming also commercial entities. Um, so a company that students in my lab have uh, been running um, uh, has developed a simple autoscope. Um, I got earaches all the time as a kid, and we would make that trip to the emergency room. 
where they'd look at it and then say something to my parents and we'd go home. Um, so, so now that sort of thing is, is possible. You can snap a picture and send a picture and get a diagnosis. Um, mobile phones can also be used um, in a clinical setting um, in place of a stethoscope. Uh, so uh, some very talented undergraduates actually from UC Berkeley developed this, uh, this uh, connected uh, stethoscope which records uh, and is able to interpret some of the, the sounds that are heard through a stethoscope. Uh, even ultrasound can be uh, converted from a big machine that used to be wheeled into rooms uh, into something that is handheld with images displayed uh, on a tablet. Um, and uh, uh, electrocardiographs can be taken on mobile phones as well, using it again as a display and as a computer. So there are a lot of exciting uh, potential for phones to make an impact on our healthcare, not just tracking things um, or giving us information about um, our environment or what we eat, uh, but really by making measurements on us so that we can remain informed. Um, and maybe uh, one day, um, Apple, when you drive through the Bay Area or somewhere else, you'll see big billboards of red blood cells or <laughs> tumor cells or, or exosomes or all these wonderful things that we need to know about that are known in hospitals, but we could know if we had the right technology. Thank you. Thanks. That was great. So our next presenter, Mark Koska, has spent 20 years promoting auto-disabled devices on syringes and persuading the global health community of their benefits in saving lives and healthcare costs. His engineering company, Star Trek, is a leader in syringe manufacturing consultancy. He is the inventor of the K1 and following auto disable syringes, as well as the founder of the Safe Point Trust, an advocate for needle safety in immunization and therapeutic sectors. Here to present Disrupting the Way Injectables Are Packed, Shipped, and Delivered to the World, Mark Koska. Did you do that one? Hi, everyone. I'm going to invite you to become a goldfish for the next 10 minutes. With me, I'm, a, I'm the goldfish leaping from one bowl to the other, so are you. And I'm also going to give you a category, which is that you don't like bees. By the end of it, you might. There's a big issue in the world with transporting um, drugs and vaccines around the world. And just for the sake of this talk, let's just focus in on the vaccines for the moment. At the moment, one in five children are currently not being fully vaccinated where there is enough money, there's enough vaccine, there's enough equipment to do that, but they're not being reached. One of the reasons for this is that 50% of all the vaccines that are uh, supplied in that UNICEF um, supply system funded by Gavi are liable to denature by the time they reach the patient. They denature because of temperature, they denature because they break, they denature because of lots of other issues that come in. And this results in an unnecessary one and a half million deaths every year. That's one every 20 seconds, which is quite alarming. Now, as I mentioned, we've got an amazing set of production facilities with vaccines. We've got incredible suppliers who are making to global standards the most incredible vaccines which have been researched for years produced beautifully and then sent out into the distribution system. And we've got patients who clearly need these vaccines and need these treatments, and they are the recipient and the recipient of all our efforts. But in the middle, we've got this reliable access question because it breaks all the time. And what I want to do is to suggest that there is a technology change that is required which will allow us to stop issues like this where we're transporting drugs in a most archaic way when they come to the last few miles. So who the hell am I? Well, Julie kindly introduced me. Um, I'm Pisces, by the way, so that helps with the goldfish analogy. Um, I uh, started this journey in 1984, 30-odd 30, uh, 30 years ago, over 30 years ago, and I invented a K, the K1 syringe, which is this one here. It's now the sort of the world's leading um, syringe for auto disable. It looks and smells like a normal syringe. You use it in the same way. And if you try and reuse it, it locks and breaks. This is now the largest supplied product to UNICEF. So we're very proud to play a role in that 
um, field. It's made on the same equipment for the same price and used in exactly the same way as a normal syringe. So there's no detriment for the safety benefit that, that we give. We've now been able to sell six billion of these syringes in, uh, in immunization programs, of which we're very proud because we've been able to save over 10 million fatal infections being transferred from patient to patient. And we, and as I as mentioned, I was able to work with the World Health Organization to introduce a new um, standard, which will um, allow all, all syringes in the world by 2020 to become safety engineered. So the point of my presentation is this. We're dealing with 100-year-old technology. The syringe was patented about 140 years ago, made in glass, obviously, and about 60 years ago transferred over into plastic but it's still the same model that we've been stuck with all along. They are a problem. Syringes in, have been predicted and have sadly come true to be one of the major transmission routes of viruses because they are reused between patient and patient, and this has been monitored incredibly closely. Even in Santa Barbara, which this is the map of, some of you obviously will have a second home there, um, will uh, be, may or may not be aware of the, uh, the outbreaks that occurred. Nevada's a really big place for reporting outbreaks through the reuse of syringes, but Santa Barbara, which is probably the most alarming. Now let's turn to the vial. The glass vial, which again is around 120 years old, is a product which has been made um, and it takes about three weeks from the start of the raw material, synthesizing it, processing it, shaping it into a bottle, sterilizing it, and filling it with the product. So that's a three-week pro uh, program to get these things made. However, they are a very much a weak link in the chain that we're discussing. The FDA recalls um, alert service, which I'm signed up to, put alerts on every single week for recalls of drugs that are coming back from the supply chain because of particles inside. Glass isn't as inert as we think, and actually it starts to flake on the inside, and these, vis these are invisible or visible particles which are drawn up and then injected into the patient, and all glass vials are subject to this. There's many workarounds, but they're all expensive, they all take longer, they're, they're just not the, the solution that we should be looking for. And one alternative which has been around for a long time are these little plastic vials, blow, fill, seal. You may be familiar with these if you wear contact lenses or you've had eye drops, um, and these are quite amazing. Unlike a glass vial, you can drop them on the floor, they're easy to throw out of an aeroplane, and the two problems that we had with them were, uh, in the past were that we didn't have the plastics to mold them out of, which were compatible with the, the modern-day vaccines. And also, we're not allowed to put a needle inside these, these plastic vials because it can puncture the vial and hit the healthcare worker or make the, the vial leak. So this has been a major problem. Now, these bottles are very, very simply made. In fact, this process, this diagram shows you the process from forming the bottle, filling it with the vaccine, and closing it so it's a sealed sterile unit takes six seconds compared to three weeks. So there's a, a fantastic goal for us to aim for to go in that direction. Now, injections are given in four major ways, from intramuscular, uh, about an inch deep into the body, which is mo where most vaccines are targeted, all the way through to other areas, intravenous, subcutaneous, and intradermal, which is a very shallow injection. And what I've done is taken an in the inspiration from the bee, the bee that we don't like currently as, as we're all goldfish, and I've designed this little blister. Now, this blister, compared to a syringe, is this big but it gives exactly the same injection. This is a tiny little platform which, we, which mimics the way a bee stings, and we can fill it from the back so we don't need to put the needle inside the vial, and we can then just push against the skin and squeeze the blister. We can replicate all of the injections that a syringe and needle gives, so we can now see that there is a, a massive opportunity for this. So when the two come together, we can co-join the bottle with the blister in the field and with security of having different shapes of fitting between the bottle and the, the unit, we're able to, let's say a hexagon is for hepatitis, so a hepatitis dose cannot be given in the wrong quantity through this system to the patient. So that means that we can move and WHO have approved this to untrained use. 
So making, making use of the community healthcare workers, which we've been discussing here a lot in Aspen, making use of them is a very, very valuable component because it will 20x, 30x the delivery possibilities for vaccines around the world. Now, they can come in lots of different sizes. They're incredibly compact. Uh, they could be color-coded for whichever drug they're delivering. And the much uh, talked about drone. But what's important about this photograph is that we can fit 5,000 of these products in a small box about this size and fly them on a drone with the vaccines to the place that we need to get them to. Now, the equivalent is somewhere around three land cruisers, Toyota land cruisers. So to be able to do this in a very small space has huge advantages. We can also reconstitute drugs. At the moment, these are the, the instructions for reconstituting drugs, which is the powder which you add liquid to, give it a shake, and then reconstitute it into a liquid, has always been a massive uh, challenge for the vaccine delivery system. But we can do that by putting the dried powder inside the blister, adding water, and then being able to deliver single-dose units of this. And very quickly, we've got lots of different ways we can use this blister. We can use it for eye drops, ear drops, nasal sprays, oral delivery, wound care, etc. The patents are quite incredible. No one has ever thought of this. There are 5,000 odd patents on safety syringes and needles, and there is no one has ever filed a patent, until me, uh, on field-filled blisters. So it's a very, very exciting area to look at. The benefits are incredible. We can fit 16 million of these devices on a 40-foot shipping container, whereas it takes nine containers to do the same with syringes and needles, like the one I've just shown you. So this means nine lorries delivering to the port, nine containers, nine lorries out the other side, nine times the warehouse space, and you can see the advantages. It's cheaper to make, much easier to set up manufacturing. It's about a fifth of the cost. Uh, distribution, transport, storage, all a fraction of the, of the size of before. And the most important advantage is we don't need any trained healthcare workers to be able to deliver this. And this equals access. So, ladies and gentlemen, instead of us having to put the pressure on the system, as you see here, what I want to do is take a disruptive step and have you all invited to help me um, come through and uh, deliver this system. Thank you. There was Stay later for the video. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Our next presenter, Teresa Dankovich is the co-founder and chief technical officer of Folia Water, a social enterprise seeking to provide clean, affordable drinking water worldwide that produces the paper in the drinkable book. She co-founded and invented Page Drinking Paper in 2014 while pursuing her PhD in chemistry at McGill University. She was named one of Fast Company's most creative people and her invention was included in Time's 25 Best Inventions list in 2015. Here to present Ensuring Safe Drinking Water Around the World, Teresa Dankovich. Okay. Good afternoon. Um, I actually have a different title. It's called Paper for Pennies, Water for Billions. And this is our aspiration for our product. Um, so as she already said, our aim is to improve clean drinking water or to provide clean drinking water all over the world, no matter where you are. And the way to do this, or our proposed way, is this new exciting technology called the Drinkable Book. Um, so the Drinkable Book has two unique components. First of all, it's a collection of water filters that are antimicrobial, so um, it also includes instructions on how to use this and why you need to use it. Um, so it, it basically just, I don't have any slides, more slides about this, but you pull out the f paper filter and then you put it in a filter holder, pour water through it, just like you would make coffee, except you don't have to have the ground coffee in there. Um, so the places that we are targeting with this technology is basically 
Africa, Asia, parts of Latin America, and you can see the number of people um, on the slide who do not have access to clean drinking water. And this is just by the World Health Organization's definition. It does not include people who have piped water, but poor quality, i.e. lots of bacteria in their piped water. So we expect this number to be much, much higher. Uh, and at, as we are at a health conference, I do have to stress that waterborne illness from poor drinking water kills millions of people each year. And this number is greater than the number of people killed by war and terrorism. To move on to something less uh, tragic, I'd like to also draw inspiration for mobile technologies, which has been a popular theme today. Um, I'll talk about a little bit different of an aspect. So again, we'll go back to Africa. Um, this is uh, some research from the Pew Research Center. You can see the colored countries, South Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, Ghana, Uganda, very few landlines there. The US is the black bar, about 60%. We look at mobile phone ownership. This is from 2002, this data. You can see it's similar levels to landlines. We fast forward a decade, and we can see that, um, you can, maybe you can see the light colored bars, how prevalent mobile phone ownership is in Africa. Almost 80% in many, many countries. So with this idea, let's compare this to water. So um, as I was saying before, it's a huge problem in Africa. Three out of 10 Africans do not have access to piped water. And this schematic is showing that the majority of these people are living in rural, remote areas. This is around the 300 million mark. So the main problem, so the piped water happens in the urban areas. It's pretty affordable. There's also vendor trucks of water and kiosks. However, when you get further out, people often rely on surface water or some wells. The only mobile option are sachets, and these are, as you can see, quite pricey. These are, this is data from Accra, Ghana. So this is our goal. We want to be the mobile technology for water. And because we can produce large volumes of paper using scalable paper manufacturing, this technique that, of add-in uh, Biocide to paper can be done on a paper machine. This is a drier section of a paper machine. Um, we think that this is an attainable goal. So another aspect about this technology that is quite compelling is the ease of transport. So I'm gonna go through a few slides explaining this. So this is a filter. It is 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters by um, one uh, millimeter thick. Um, this can provide 100 liters of clean water which is enough for one person for one month. So the next step is let's look at the next sense of scale. So a liter of space is 100 filters or two drinkable books, and that's enough for 10 people for one year. And you can keep on going with the analogy. If you have a hiker's backpack, which holds roughly 50 liters of volume, this is 5,000 filters. There's a roll of the paper and that could be enough for a small village or a small refugee camp for a year. So how do we get there? That's the real question. As you've heard, this is a fairly new technology. Um, the drinkable book is going out there around the world. This is a man in Kenya reading it, um, but it's not yet out there everywhere. Um, so I'm gonna just give you some background on the technology. So I've called it page drinking paper, page being the AG being silver. Um, which is a clue to how it works. So the paper is impregnated with silver nanoparticles, which are highly toxic to bacteria. And as you can see here, the bacteria die basically upon absorbing the silver. But it's not that much silver. It's still very affordable. The majority of this product is paper itself, and we can also make this from recycled paper. So it could be quite, um, have a green impact as well. Um, most of the time I've spent Working on this project, I was in the lab developing new methods to do this and testing it out and have shown that it works just as well as any other water purificator, purification technology out there. But it has some, it's a little bit better than say chlorine because there's no off taste to it. Um, we've also gone all over the world and testing this. I've been 
personally to South Africa, Ghana, Bangladesh, and Honduras, and worked with partners in some of these other countries in um, evaluating whether people are interested in this and how we can best design filters for everybody <laughs> who needs this. Um, one of the most inspiring quotes I've heard out there in the field is this woman here in rural Bangladesh, um, she was trying out one version of our filters, um, as you can see here, and one of the quotes was, if my husband does not buy these filters for me and my family, I would write poetry to buy this paper and start a business to sell it and so I can earn more money. So how do we make this a universal technology? Well, I'll tell you a little bit about my travels. In Honduras, we asked women what they thought, and they said, oh, this is great, but I hate pouring water into the filter. Can't, is there some way you can make it a little bit better so I don't have to spend all day pouring water through some paper? Well, the answer was, yeah, sure. We can uh, design. I came back. This is um, a collaboration with some of the other employees at Folia Water. We came back and said, well, let's do this cone shape, but if we have some way to put the water bottle upside down on top, you just fill the water bottle and let it drain through. And you can see that this could work with jerry cans in Africa and also with just two liter bottles, which are found almost everywhere I've traveled. Um, but then there are some unique um, water collection devices like this uh, metal container here called a kolshi in Bangladesh so that maybe they won't quite go for the same designs. So these questions are very important for us to try to answer as we move the technology out into the real world. And you might be also asking about, what about what's printed on the pages? So this is a sample page. It says, the water in your village may contain deadly diseases, but each page of this book is a paper filter that will make your water safe to drink. You might note this is printed in English. Yes. <laughs> so we also have on the bottom of the page, on the separate filter, which I can show you the book later if you're interested, um, it translated into Swahili, but of course, there are many, many languages and many dialects. So we need to also translate this to the appropriate languages. And one of my goals is to not just include, this is rather dry uh, text, but to include stories that people can relate to culturally as well as you know, convey important information. And many people obviously cannot read out there, so we cannot rely on text alone. Um, this is a drawing that uh, a professor at University of Massachusetts College of Art um, loved the idea, and he really wanted to um, have his class make designs for the book. So this is one of his designs of just a simple way to illustrate how to use it. And we we're looking forward to making lot, a lot more cartoons and other pictograms. And so lastly, this is uh, hopefully not just going to be a way to provide clean water, but also inform people about not just water quality and disease, but maybe m many more things. Um, uh, something I saw today. Um, on actually my web, company's website, I don't control the website, uh, was that in, there was a illustration of, in Chinese, how to use the drinkable book to learn English, which I was like, wait, who made this? This is crazy. So maybe this is already happening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
there's some good treatments for cancer. There's chemotherapy, surgery, radiotherapy, and more recently, targeted therapies. And as we heard earlier, there are survivors. But unfortunately, there are some patients whose tumors shrink or are removed, but don't get prolongation of their life. And even worse, there are some patients who get absolutely no benefit from therapy. In fact, this year in the United States, 600,000 patients will die, and the biggest killer of all of them will be lung cancer. Now, these, these cancers and, and these treatments have one thing in common. The treatments target the tumor. Pretty logical, right? The big idea I want to talk to you about today is about a treatment that doesn't target the tumor, but targets the immune system. Now, the idea of control by the immune system of tumors has been around for many centuries, in fact. But like many great ideas, it's been impossible to reduce it to practice. In fact, it's not even been sure that it really is the case. But there have been hints. So going back decades, there were rare patients with skin cancer, melanoma, and kidney cancer who spontaneously went into remission. No treatment, their cancers went away. And it was thought that maybe the immune system woke up and got rid of the tumors. Then back in the 80s, during the AIDS epidemic, many of the AIDS patients, in fact, higher than normal, got cancer. And some of them died. And the idea here was that, the, that HIV was killing the T cells and immune suppressing them and the, and the tumors that were there were growing. And then back in the 90s, there was a immunotherapy approved by the FDA for use in melanoma and in renal cell cancer. Um, and it was effective in some patients. In fact, it caused these amazing remissions. Unfortunately, it didn't have much impact because it was pretty difficult to tolerate. In fact, it was a bit like hitting the TV with a hammer if you're trying to fix it. Sometimes the TV would actually work. Many times you just broke the TV. So despite these hints, and despite some zealous believers, there was basically widespread skepticism that immunotherapy would ever really work. Now, I like the definition of innovators as people with head in the clouds and feet on the ground, and you've heard uh, many of that today, this afternoon. So for us to be successful in biopharma, we take biological insights that support those head-in-the-cloud ideas, and we translate them into medicines. That, and the important thing is these have to be medicines that drive value for patients. Now, the problem is, the challenge for us, is that there are a lot of very cool ideas. You know that. Uh, and most of them don't actually lead to safe and effective medicines. And unfortunately, it takes an awful lot of feet on the ground uh, to do that. And many of the feet on the ground are driving towards failure. So in this case, the head in the cloud idea was to use the immune system to get rid of cancer, to target the tumor. And the value for the patient was the potential for them to live longer. So in other words, it was perhaps we could induce these kind of remissions that where the tumor went away and they would have long-term uh, long-term survivorship. Now, like many highly innovative ideas, immunotherapy looks rather obvious when you look in the rearview mirror. Uh, but I can tell you it wasn't very obvious at the time. And there were actually many different challenges, many twists and turns as we went down the road, and indeed many skeptics. And I will say the decision to invest in immuno-oncology back about 15 years ago just wasn't very straightforward. Now, at the time, there were two theories about how the immune system uh, might be evaded by cancer. One was um, that the cancer sort of hid from the immune system, rather like the Romulan cloaking device in Star Trek. The other was that the, the tumor was in full sight of the immune system, but the immune system found a way to switch it off. And the breakthrough was when Jim Allison, a medical researcher at UC Berkeley at the time, and now Alaska awardee, um, he, he sort of characterized a cellular pathway 
that could put the brakes on the immune system. And he found a way to inhibit that pathway in cancer models in, in mice, and the tumor shrunk and some went away. Now, many cancer drugs work in mice and they never work in humans. So the next step was to look, can we do this in humans? And Jim, partnering with Alan Corman and Nils Lomberg, who are still researchers at BMS, uh, these two came up with a monoclonal antibody that was, they could test in humans in uh, the skin cancer melanoma. Unfortunately, as the testing progressed, there were many challenges. It turns out that immunotherapy does not work like chemotherapy, for instance. Um, the treatment effects are different. The timing is different. Um, while uh, that there are benefits in terms of survival, somehow the tumors didn't always shrink as much. And there were different side effects, which required different treatments. And these, some of these were serious side effects, even fatal, if they weren't treated properly. So this rather unpleasant slide here, and I apologize for this, gives you uh, an idea of the problem we face. So this shows a melanoma, a skin cancer on a patient. And on the left, it shows stage four. This is late melanoma um, and before treatment. And then at 12 weeks after treatment, um, it's actually grown bigger. Now, that is a problem. Uh, with conventional therapy, if it grows bigger, you fail the treatment, you come off the clinical trial, and you go and have a different treatment. But as you can see here, what actually happened two weeks after that was that the tumor became smaller, and after two years, it had completely gone. So if we hadn't waited a bit longer, we would have missed the benefits. What was happening there? It turned out that the T cells were going into the tumor. There was inflammation. This was a good indication of a good response. So despite the appearances, something unique was happening, something good was happening, and that somehow tumors can grow before shrinking. So basically, based on this experience, our early experience, we had to basically change completely the way we did these trials. We had to interpret the efficacy results diff differently. We had to manage the side effects differently. Essentially, it was a completely different paradigm. Um, while it was very unfamiliar then, it's become much more familiar now. Now, our first uh, medicine was approved in 2011 for melanoma and was a very significant advance for melanoma patients. Um, and there's been an extraordinary pace of innovation since then with more medicines approved and combinations being approved. And just to give you a sense of how amazing this is, in stage four melanoma, that's metastatic melanoma, late stage, in 2008, less than 10% of people were alive at two years. Today, based on clinical trial data of a combination, two thirds of patients are alive at two years. And some patients we've been following for a while are alive at 10 years, quite extraordinary. It's, it's amazing science, it's an amazing fact, it gives hope to patients and really gives them back precious moments that they wouldn't have had. Um, what really turned out to be transformation was when we saw a signal in lung cancer. Remember I told you that's the biggest killer in the United States, very few treatments in the last 15 years. Um, and we knew, we knew we were onto something big. Now, with, like with all radical ideas, it takes a while to get general acceptance. In fact, it's a lot of skepticism before, before you get that. But of course, when it becomes obvious, everyone piles in. And this slide is a very good illustration of that. You can see this shows, it's just one measure of that, but it's the number of clinical trials that have been started every year in, with immunotherapies. And you can see that it's been exponential for the last couple of years. And I've put on this when the first IO drug was approved, and that didn't really change very much. It was truly extraordinary, of course, but people sort of couldn't believe it, ignored it. But what caught their attention was 2012, when they saw very exploratory data in lung cancer, but in a, in a disease that really had very few options. So, you know, what was really exciting about this was those strange patients with remissions, that those oddities turned out to be a window onto a, a fundamental process that w allowed us to find medicines to, to reverse it. And it's just the tip of the iceberg. It's suddenly become one of the hottest tickets in academia and, and the pharmaceutical industry is piling in as well. Um, the cycle of innovation, I've never seen it turn as fast. It's quite extraordinary. There are a lot of feet on the ground. Um, and it's showing 
potential across multiple tumors and with multiple combinations. It really is a historical time in cancer research. So I've, let me finish by saying, really to deliver on the promise that immuno-oncology offers and to deliver the value, which I talked about at the beginning, to society, for us in this room, I think, I hope I'll never need it, but it's there if I do, uh, and, the, and for future generations. I think it requires all of us in the healthcare ecosystem to clearly think about things differently, you know, to interact differently, and, and to uh, look at things in a different way, be open to that newness. Now, I thought this was a very appropriate uh, way of finishing this quote to tell you where we are with I.O., but it turns out it's rather ironically appropriate for the Brexit uh, thing that happened this morning in the UK. <laughs> but it, I, I love this one. It's Winston Churchill saying, now is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. Thanks very much. I knew we'd get a Brexit joke in there. I was holding off on my own. Um, our final presenter today is Mick, Mr. Vic Strecker. He is a behavioral scientist, professor, and director of innovation and social entrepreneurship at the University of Michigan's School of Public Health, where he founded the UM Center for Health Communication Research. He recently founded Jewel Health, a company that integrates the science of purpose in life, smartphone, and biometric technology, and big data analytics to help users align with their purpose in life. Previously, he founded the company Health Media, which was purchased by Johnson & Johnson in 2008. His most recent book is Life on Purpose, How Living for What Matters Most Changes Everything. Here to present Life on Purpose, Combining Predictive Modeling, Big Data, Mobile Technology for Mindful Living and Well-Being. Vic. Thank you so much, and thank you for waiting around. I know, there's a lot of speakers. Uh, so this is uh, my daughter, Julia. When she was six months old, she caught a virus that attacked her heart and destroyed it. She had only one hope in living, and that was to get a heart transplant. This was in 1990. Very few children had received new hearts, and she ended up becoming one of those children who received a new heart. Six years ago, she passed away, and um, when that happened, I lost my own purpose in my life. And I started drinking more, I started eating more. I kind of just kind of gave up. I didn't really have any particular reason to be around. And uh, somebody told me about this guy, Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl had gone through three concentration camps during World War II. He was a psychotherapist, and he studied the prisoners in these concentration camps. What he found was that people who started losing their purpose started getting sick, and then they would often die. It wasn't necessarily they were getting sick and then losing their purpose and dying. It was the other way around. And he, and he observed this. He said that, woe to him who saw no more sense in his life, no aim, no purpose, and therefore no point in carrying on. He was soon lost. This certainly resonated with me and helped me a great deal. His book, Man's Search for Meaning, has helped millions of people, and not just people who've gone through difficult times, but people who wanted to develop purpose. And in fact, he created a new therapy around purpose. He called it logotherapy, which is another way of saying meaning or purpose therapy. And of course, this would be traditional because he was a traditional therapist, and you would go in and you would talk to him for an hour or so, you'd come back another week, and this could be very long and fairly expensive, and maybe not be able to reach as many people as we might be able to now. Now, by the way, he also didn't have a lot of science around his purpose, other than his own observations of his patients and through concentration camp experiences. But now, in the last five to 10 years, what we've found is over 200 studies around the importance of having purpose and direction in one's life. So it turns out that people who have a strong purpose live longer. They're less likely to develop stroke by over 50%. Uh, they're less likely to develop heart attacks if they have heart disease. They're better able to manage their diabetes. If they are cocaine or alcohol abusers, they're half as likely to relapse six months after inpatient treatment if they start with a strong purpose in their lives. This is amazing. Seniors who have a strong purpose in their life, seven years later, are 2.4 times, times 
less likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. Now this is after statistically controlling for age, race, gender, income, education, health status, cognitive status, as well as health behaviors. That's pretty powerful. So why don't we spend more time in this? By the way, purpose in life even gives you better sex. We can go home now, right? So this is amazing. What if we had a purpose in life pill? This would be a multi-billion dollar pill, right? In fact, it'd be in our freaking drinking water and you'd probably be filtering it, right? So for everybody, this is unbelievable, this stuff. So I wrote a book called Life on Purpose, How Living for What Matters Most Changes Everything. And in this book, I talk about the, both the ancient philosophy as well as the very modern and amazing science around this. Over 200 studies that have been done in this area. My own purpose in my life is to enjoy love and beauty. That's my personal purpose. To be an engaged father, husband, and grandfather. That's my family purpose. To teach every one of my students as if they were my own daughter is my work purpose and to help over one billion people find greater purpose in their own lives. That is one big, hairy, audacious purpose, right? We'd all agree? That takes, for me, a lot of energy every day and a lot of willpower every day, a lot of self-control. So I need vitality and I need energy. Aristotle once said, it's not just about having purpose and then I can go to Disney World. It's more about being aligned with your purpose every single day and having this energy and having this will to be able to do that. So what I do is try to sleep every day. I try to sleep well in order to have more energy and more willpower. I meditate every single day. In fact, I don't give myself an alcoholic beverage at the end of the day until I've meditated. So I'm a great meditator. <laughs> I once totally screwed up and I, I like meditated and then forgot to drink. I'm kidding. <laughs> Sorry. Dumb joke. I try to walk to work every day. I try to be creative every day, and I try to eat well. I'm not perfect by any means at any of these things, but I do my best. I'm a pretty normal person, but I try to give those to myself. Now, also, though, if you think about those five things, they add up to what I call space. So every single day, I just try to give myself space. Let's see if the, there we go, space. I also know, not just about myself, but for other people, that we have energy and willpower at different times of the month. They vary by times of the month and by times of the week, by days of the week. It also varies by the economy. It also varies by news events. It also varies, by the way, by sports events. It turns out if your NFL football team loses on a Sunday, on a Monday that entire community eats 16% more saturated fat. This is true, not kidding. If they win, they eat 9% less saturated fat. You can imagine the class action lawsuits right now. So we all know that this affects energy and willpower, right? The weather. We also know that our significant others really affect our energy and willpower. All of these things are important. I like to view this kind of, my, my harbor is my purpose. My body is my boat. And the wind in my sails is my energy, but I also really need willpower. I need that rudder to be able to steer toward that harbor. If I have those things, if I have a harbor, and I have wind in my sails, and I have a rudder, I am healthy. And I know cancer survivors who are healthy because they have this. I know people who are severely disabled who have these things, and I'd call them healthy because they have these things. So how do we help people become more healthy? What would we do, what would Viktor Frankl do if he were alive today? Would he still develop logo therapy? I don't think so. He'd create an app. <laughs> so that's what I've done. I've created the Jewel app. Jewel was Julia's nickname. And so in this, we have a purpose composer. And we divide it into these four sectors, into personal purpose. So again, this is my personal purpose, enjoy love and beauty, my family purpose. I can dictate this into the phone if I want. Um, but if I don't know my family purpose, I can push example. And I can get other people's examples who are similar to me. I can continue going through these. And then it automatically concatenates all of these purpose statements in these domains into an overall purpose, the most important document in your entire life. And if you want to change this purpose, it's fine. It is your purpose. You can do whatever you want. Then every single day, what we ask the person to do is take a look at how aligned they are with their purpose. How aligned? Oh, super aligned with my personal purpose, super aligned with my family purpose, and eh, not so much at work lately, and then eh, not so much maybe with my community. And then suddenly, I get back to work on a Monday, and I go, oh my god, I've got 3,000 emails. I have to zip right back and be very aligned with my work. So we can monitor this every single day. 
We also can help a person figure out after 10 days using predictive modeling of what makes you tick. Here's what we need for that. We need space, sleep, presence, activity, creativity, and eating. Five positive behaviors that you self-monitor every day. It takes 30 seconds or less. We want to look at the, the weather. We can monitor that in your location right away. We can look at news events. We can look at the uh, temporal events. We can look at the economy in your local area, and we can look at your social support in your local area. All of this can be measured either through self-report or through big data, putting that all together. We can also use biometrics, and uh, in fact, over 150 biometrics, and connect that with you to help you figure out what makes you tick. In other words, we can take a look at presence. We can move that P with our finger up and down and figure out that presence, for me, really influences my willpower. And when it goes down, when I haven't meditated, I lose willpower. Really has a big impact on willpower, not so much on energy for me personally. This is my actual outlook a couple of days ago in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I had great energy it was predicting for today, but my willpower is supposed to be oh, only lukewarm. Why? So it looks at all of these things, this app does, and it says, you know what? You tend, Vic, to have medium willpower when the temperature is in the 70s. <laughs> and it was in the 70s because that's, that was the, the prescription. That was um, what was supposed to, to happen. And you weren't very active the day before. So what can I do about it? What is the raincoat I can wear when I know it's supposed to rain? Well, you know, what is that raincoat? For me, it looks at my predictive model, which is a personal predictive model, and says, you need to sleep better. So it gives me then a tip for sleep. I can say, I don't like that tip. I get another tip for sleep if I want. I can say, I'll try it. We follow that, see if you've started sleeping better. And if we have, we weight that more strongly. So. This was inspired by Viktor Frankl. It was inspired by my daughter, Julia. Every day, I hope that the world is able to build greater purpose, greater energy in their lives, greater willpower to have greater meaning. I'd like to close this by also talking about a group of people here at the Aspen Institute who are unbelievably purposeful. They've been brought in from sub-Saharan Africa, as well as other parts of the world. And because a lot of people think, this is just for rich people, is it? It's just for people who have everything else. That's not true. This new voices program from the Aspen Institute brings in these amazing people who have gone through some of the most dif difficult circumstances you could imagine, and they are driven by purpose. And this program is managed in part by my daughter, Rachel, who is right here. And I'm going to embarrass Rachel and ask her to stand up for me, if she wouldn't mind. So Rachel. Rachel works at the Aspen Institute, and tomorrow they're going to be telling their stories up at the Jerome uh, as part of this program called Undaunted. Thank you very much for your time. We're going to get some chairs set up here and allow you guys to ask these incredible presenters any questions you might have. Yep. We have uh, some microphones up front. We have a question. All set, guys? Coming. Here, I'm just going to. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you guys have all, all 
each of you have brought something to us today where you're just clearly in action about it, and we can only hope that you continue in that direction. Along the way, was there anything that you just massively changed your mind about that put you on this path, perhaps? That's a great question. Um, well, I was making a product for 33 years and decided to get rid of it. <laughs> so maybe that qualifies. And um, it was, I suppose, a culmination of different aspects that came together to make me realize that we could improve and we couldn't be complacent about what we were doing and, and that there was a much better benefit catalog that could come from a very small change. So. Yeah, I think if I, I could add that, and I think I, I saw the theme in many of the folks here too. I was a physician. I treated patients one at a time, and I moved into the drug industry and had the opportunity occasionally to have a bigger benefit more broadly. And I, and I, I think that's something that it seems many of us seem to share, I think. I think it's, it's personal experiences maybe that happen in our lives that cause us to think differently about our own lives and, and to find some purpose that uh, sends us in new directions. I'm going to say the opposite. I just didn't want to stop working on what I was working on. <laughs> I thought it was a really great idea, and I was like, okay, well, I'm a chemist, but I think I can figure out the next step. I'll talk to some engineers who work with, on water, and then just kept on talking to more and more people. And so I guess my stubbornness is my story. <laughs> Persistence, a common theme in innovations, for sure. Another question up front? My question is for Teresa. Did you do you think the your water filter would work for Flint, Michigan, with the? <laughs> you know, you're not there. The first person to ask me that, and I'm also going to tell you the answer is no. <laughs> uh, so the problem with Flint, Michigan, was due to lead, and that is a heavy metal and is not removed by our method of filtration. Um, it's possible. Um, so I've looked into ways to adapt the technology and. We don't have a new product or anything coming out tomorrow, but it is possible to have some highly absorbent um, material, whether it be paper or some other, um, you know, filter media that can absorb lead. And there are probably plenty of people out there working on that, but that is not us. <laughs> Wonderful. Another question up front. I have just an immuno oncology question. Um, do you explain why um, you, some of your uh, antibodies, you know, against something like a PDL1, um, they work in uh, higher rates in patients who've got that biomarker, but they also work in patients who don't have the biomarker. So, what exactly is the antibody binding to, and why do they, like in lung cancer, why do some of these immuno oncology antibodies uh, have an effect when the apparent target isn't exhibited on the surface of the cells? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I, I think there's, there's two simple answers and a lot of very complicated speculation. What, one I'd say is when we measure PDL1, we're taking a small bit of a biopsy and we're missing it somewhere else in the tumor. So we say they're negative, and in reality, they're positive. I think the second thing is PDL1 may actually only be a measure of some degree of inflammation within the tumor. There may be other, other measures of that which we haven't yet. Come across. There's absolutely no doubt that in general, PD1 antibodies and the one antibodies work better in patients who express a lot of it, and you get some extraordinary results. Uh, what I think the really big challenge today is we talk about these about hot tumors. There's a lot of cold tumors, uh, and the big challenge today is how do we make a cold tumor a hot tumor? And I think that's a, a source of excitement. And I think you know the PDL1 story will point us a little bit in that direction. One at the back. With better eyes than I do. Sorry. Question in the back. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for a really, really inspiring set of presentations. Um, you know, I think many of you talked about how technology can make uh, public health interventions faster, cheaper, more scalable. Can you also talk about how these types of changes can help uh, increase people's interest in investing in human capacity and also public health systems? Uh, because those things are so critical to allow uh, your new technologies to actually be put into place. That's a great point. 
can, I can relate one, uh, one story with uh, this mobile phone device that we've been using in Cameroon. Uh, the, the group that is leading the clinical study in Cameroon is it's an institute based there. Um, and since the, our, our study ended, they still have the devices. Um, and they've become the ones who are now training others um, in Africa to, to use them simply to do a, a surveillance in other countries. And so it's, it's become their device, and they're the ones who are training people, using it, uh, and, and handling the data that comes back. And, and so um, you know, by, by empowering them to, to, to do whatever uh, needs to be done with the devices afterwards, um, they're uh, addressing important needs and uh, taking ownership over, uh, over that, uh, uh, that process. I can say um, from our Jewel Health Company, we're working with so many different intermediary organizations, which is what you always do in, in public health. And so we're um, in a, a lot of discussions with various companies, uh, small and large, but also with the AARP, uh, with many universities, with um, just a very broad spectrum of organizations, health insurance plans, and uh, some government organizations. So um, I like to work through these intermediary organizations to reach a, a much larger number of people. I think one of the, uh, the secondary benefits that's going to come out of this wearable health technology that we all have Fitbits or we have self and self monitoring is just this increased awareness of our own health and our own parameters. And I think that's going to lead to um, you know, better health for ourselves and how we, you know, the food that we eat, the exercise that we do. Uh, I think this information too is going to be more and more widely available to our physicians and we haven't quite figured out how that's going to work, but, but when it does, I think we'll, we'll have better data to, to track a lot of our health parameters. And I think as a society, as a as the public, we'll have much better health care that way. I think we have time for one more question and we have a, in the audience. Clearly all, uh, all of you are cutting edge at 216. If we go out five years from now, you'll probably look back and say, can you believe we were doing this stuff? But that said, can a couple of you comment on what the next big reach is in your particular areas? Uh, I can say that uh, when we talk about 3D printing, people, either automatically or have an inclination to ask me about bioprinting. I'm also kind of involved in that world. Uh, I do think that those technologies are emerging. Right now, what we're missing is really the human talent. So we have 3D printing technology, that's my world. And then we have cell biologists, that's somebody else's world. And right in the middle is where you're going to need a bioprinting engineer. And we're not quite there yet. Uh, we, I don't think people begin their respective uh, studies going toward that, com that center ground, but I think that's where we're going. Um, and hopefully we'll be here to talk about printing out um, uh, living tissue or absorbable tissue uh, in the future. I think on the high tech side, I would say gene editing is going to be extraordinary. And I just noted this week, I think they approved the first clinical trial in gene editing. That could totally change our idea of pharmaceuticals from pills and liquids to something completely different. I, I think from my years. perspective, we'll have a uh, much greater awareness of, our, of what makes you tick. Socrates once said the unexamined life is not worth living. And I think we're better examining that light, our lives now genetically, environmentally, behaviorally. And then Aristotle went on, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said that the purposeless life isn't even worth examining. So. Hopefully, we'll have at least another billion people interested in their purpose. Well, I think we've hit our, um, our time slot today. I want to thank each of our presenters. You guys. Have been